Well, somebody this morning asked about metaphysics, because I use that word metaphysics. Now, it's probably just to show you that for Father Peter, he used so many words that were just so commonplace in Catholic vocabulary before the council, most Catholics would understand the vocabulary because they were taught these things. One of the biggest problems in our world today are not theological errors, they're philosophical errors. Because philosophy is the study of, of course, it's the love of wisdom, philosophia, and a lot of the, and philosophy is a handmaid to theology. All the sciences, if you want to talk about what's the highest of all the sciences? Well, the science that has as its object the highest things, which is theology, is the highest of all the sciences. That means all the other sciences in some way serve the highest. So after theology, then we have the study of wisdom or the study of being, you want to put it that way, philosophy. Then under that comes your physical sciences, you know, physics, biology, mathematics. Actually, mathematics is higher because physics is part of mathematics. Going down the line until you get to, you know, biology, geology, whatever. But all these sciences, if there are true science, serve the highest, which is theology. So metaphysics is really the study of nature or of being. Meta means from the Greek kind of beyond, and physics, of course, means beyond the material being of something. To be able to see, you know, you can look at something and say, oh, I see that. It's a physical thing. But metaphysics, it tells me what that is. It's a, oh, it's a chair, but it has an, it has an essence, has a nature. You have a nature, a human nature. So metaphysics is really the study of being, how things are, what they are, essences and natures. God didn't make, you know, God created from nothing, but he said, let there be light. What's the nature of light? Let there be darkness. What is darkness? Everything has a nature and an essence that God didn't create things he didn't make an amorphous blob, you know, even amoebas, which is the closest thing you can get to an amorphous blob, has a name, as we know what it, when we talk about an amoeba or a jellyfish or something. Everything has a nature. What is it? You know, when you see something for the first time, you say, what is it? I don't know what that is. Until finally, you know, you come to understand its nature or being. That's why we're given an intellect. We're given a memory, intellect, and will. Not just an intellect and a will, but a memory, intellect, and will, according to the fathers and doctors. Because in your soul, not only is your soul made in the image and likeness of God because it's a spiritual being, but it's also made in the image and likeness of God because God is Trinitarian. Three persons in one God. We have three powers in one soul. We don't have three souls. We have one soul. But in that soul, we have a memory, and a memory is something, because without the memory, you can't think. If you can't remember anything, you can't do anything. We have a lot of people in care homes right now who have Alzheimer's, and they can't, they don't know who they are, or where they are, or what they're doing. There's a lot of people in our world today who have spiritual Alzheimer's, because they don't know, first of all, who they are. They don't know their, they don't know their nature. So Father Peter would always quote, he was quoting St. Bonaventure, our metaphysics is Christ. Meaning, if you want to understand, that's why the absolute primacy is so important. He's the blueprint. He's the exemplar, or the model, you might say, for everything. And you take Christ out of the picture, as I said, you get chaos. It's either Christ or chaos. So that now we have, we have people being put to highest levels of our government who don't even know what a woman is. That's pretty scary. That we let people like that rise to an official level of, you might say, you're supposed to be a level of competence, but it's incompetence. Of course it may be political, but still, it still is the same thing as, we, it's chaos, it's foolishness. 
And the Boethius said, those whom the gods destroy, they first make mad. And our nature, our, our society is becoming very much a madhouse. Because Christ keeps getting kicked out more and more all the time. So, Father Peter, <laughs> Father Peter was such a good student of St. Bonaventure at his funeral. When Father Peter passed away on May 8th, of all days, was the Feast of Our Lady of Mediatrix of All Graces. And Father Peter was promoting Our Lady his whole life long. But the priest said that Father Peter was, his initials, PDF. He was a PDF of St. Bonaventure. You know, you know, it's like a photocopy. You want to know what St. Bonaventure was? Just ask Father Peter. He was like a living PDF of St. Bonaventure. But, um, so, this is what I wanted to kind of touch upon. And I mentioned to you, you know, many people think history moves like this. You know, one, two, three, four, five events, one after the other. But I said that that's all of, even the physical world and the metaphysical world, the scriptural world, it moves more like this through time. He's repeating, going back to, to original th theme that God works, going to an end, but as God likes to do, circular fashion, keeps repeating things over and over and keeps putting more information into it till we get to where we're going. We showed yesterday how that is scriptural by Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 10. And I wanted to just show you where he's also... And we talked about typology being so important. And I, yesterday I made a mistake. And I realized because I, it's not David who got down off his throne. It was Solomon. Because Bathsheba was the mother of Solomon. Bathsheba was the wife of David, but Solomon's her son. So Solomon's a type of Christ too. He got off of his throne, and he paid reverence to his mother Bathsheba. So I wanted to correct that. So he probably said, Father's an idiot. He does, he's an idiot. He didn't know what he's talking about. So, but... Um, And as I told you yesterday, that absolute primacy of Christ, the joint predestination of Jesus and Mary, is an infallible teaching of the ordinary magisterium of the church, requiring the, of the faithful a religious assent of the mind and will. And so, where does this appear? In, so, we showed that it's scriptural. It's also in the fathers and doctors with well, the great saint of the early church, St. Irenaeus, is where we, the first one we kind of get this notion of recapitulation, recirculation, that Christ, we have the first Adam and the first Eve. Well, St. Irenaeus was an apostle of St. John. St. Irenaeus talks about the first Adam and the first Eve. And then Christ and Mary are the second Adam and the second Eve, or the new Adam and the new Eve, of the new creation, which of course is this new creation, which is the church, that we all have been given this grace that we can now live this new life, of being able to live the life of grace. That's a new life, that's a new creation. But um, it's interesting that in the message of Our Lady of Akita in Japan, this whole notion of new Adam, new Eve, and second Adam and second Eve, and the first Adam and the first Eve, is that the statue in Akita wept 101 times. And Sister Agnes was thinking to herself, why did the statue weep 101 times? And the angel, her guardian angel, was reading her mind. He said, well, the first one is the first Eve who ate of the fruit and because of her disobedience caused our fall. You know, it was Adam that fell, but he had a helper in Eve, collaborated. He said the zero, this circle in the middle, is the eternity of God, the circularity. So we see this, you know, this recapitulation. 
The second one is the new Eve, or Mary, who, as Pope Francis talked about his favorite devotion to Our Lady, is the undoer of knots, which comes from St. Irenaeus, but also from the fathers and doctors, said that by her obedience, she undid the knot of disobedience that the first one did. So this whole notion of being recircled, the beginning is at the end and the end is at the beginning. It's all there in Genesis 3.15, as I said. It's so important that we have this kind of like the big picture and the road map, you might say, so you know where you're going. It's important that we are able to see the signs, but also interpret them correctly. That's why we have the church. The church is there to say, this doesn't mean that, it means this. Because if you, if we can see what happens when you have, you're your own interpreter of signs. You end up with Protestantism. It's like the state trooper was driving down the road, and he saw this car just creeping along, just barely moving on the highway. So he pulled him over, he went up to the driver's side, and there was the sister at the wheel. He said, sister, why are you driving so slow? He said, the speed limit is 60 miles an hour. So, oh, I sign back there said it was six. He goes, no, sister, that's not the speed limit, that's highway six. Oh, thank you. And as he looked into the car, he saw on the passenger side, there was a sister frozen like that in time, and three in the back. He said, sister, what's wrong with them? He goes, oh, we just got off of 395. <laughs> so you have to know what the signs mean. And that's why we have so many people, it's 395 and they're going six or whatever. This, it's all confusing. So that's why God has given us a church to help us to read the signs and know what they mean. But joint predestination, Pope Pius IX, blessed Pius IX, the one who proclaimed the Immaculate Conception as a dogma of the faith on December 8, 1854, in his encyclical, Inefabulous Deus. Now, it's an encyclical, meaning it's part of the infallible teaching authority of the church. And this was the encyclical he wrote, proclaiming the Immaculate Conception as a dogma of the faith. Now listen to what he says here. From the very beginning and before time began, the Eternal Father chose and prepared for His only begotten Son, a mother in whom the Son of God would become incarnate, and from whom, in the blessed fullness of time, He would be born into this world. Above all creatures did God so loved her that truly in her was the Father well pleased with singular delight. Therefore, far above all the angels and all the saints, so wondrously did God endow her with the abundance of all heavenly gifts poured from the treasury of his divinity that this mother, ever absolutely free of all stain of sin, all fair and perfect, would possess that fullness of holy innocence and sanctity than which under God... One cannot even imagine anything greater in which outside of God no man can succeed in comprehending fully. That's a big statement. In other words, he's saying, after God, remember when we talked about, you know, God wills in an orderly fashion. I'm going to write over things here because I don't have time to erase. You know, outside of the Trinity, what is it that gives God the greatest glory? Is Jesus Christ in his human nature. And right on falling on that is the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the Immaculate Conception. Then angels, men, animals, whatever, all in succession. So under God, after God, the next great holiness that we can, that we can imagine is the Immaculate Conception. St. Maxim Colby, as you know, we've heard this, those of you who've been in the MIM so many years, St. Maximilian Colby says, God is as far above Our Lady because He's a divine person and she's only a human person. Even though she's immaculate, He's so far above her because He's divine. So because of her immaculate conception, Our Lady is so far above us. 
Because she has all the graces. Whatever grace you have is a share of what she has in its fullness. As we said, God made his mother perfect. He didn't just make her 99% beautiful or 99% pure or just 99% whatever it is. She has it to its fullness. And so whatever you have, whatever virtues you have, whatever is just a share of what she has in all of its fullness. It says the fathers and doctors say that when the Holy Trinity finished making Our Lady, they were exhausted. Now when God created the world, he had the seventh day for rest. But that was not for him. That was for his creation. But for the fathers and doctors said, God so spent himself in making his mother that they were exhausted. And Father Peter says, in quoting St. Thomas, there's three quasi-infinites in creation. Quasi-infinites. It means that God could have made a more beautiful world than he did at the beginning. He could have made Adam and Eve more perfect than he did at the beginning. But there's three things God could not have done any better than he did. He outdid himself when he did these three things. The incarnation, when he became man. When God became man, not only in that he became man, but in the manner in which he did it, he did it in the most perfect way. Hold to it, because he could do it this way, it was fitting that he do it this way, ergo fece, he did it. Because the incarnation is related to the divine maternity, he could not have made a more perfect mother than he did. He could not make a more perfect woman than he did when he made Our Lady. So first, incarnation. Second, divine maternity. Third, in the redemption. God could not have done more than he did when he died on the cross. Not only did he die on the cross, but in the manner in which he did it. He could not have done it any more perfectly. No one can say to Jesus when they see him on the last day, Lord, you could have suffered more for us. You could have done more for us than you did. No, he could not have. He did all that he could do to the most perfect degree. He didn't just shed. He could have shed, St. Alphonse says, our Lord could have shed one tiny little drop of blood, and that would have satisfied divine justice at his, for example, at his circumcision. That would have been enough to satisfy divine justice, you might say. But as St. Alphonse says, it didn't satisfy divine love. So our Lord, of course, when we thought he had no blood to give, when they pierced his side, it said a torrent of blood and water came out of his side. He poured himself out completely for love of us. He could not have done any more. It's like, as I told you about that statue of our Lord's, you know, if we were to look upon our Lord in his scourging alone, you would think, oh Lord, that was, surely that's enough. But it didn't satisfy him. He, almost, he looked like walking ground beef after they got done with him. It's, it's hard to imagine a man so brutally, you know, whipped, and because it didn't just whip him, it ripped his flesh. He was really looking like a, just one big, massive wound. You know, there's probably not a spot that he could have touched that didn't hurt. So that is the three quasi-infinites that Father Peter says St. Thomas talks about this in his Summa Theologica. So I shared with you that quote from Blessed Pius IX. And just to show you that what Father Peter's echoing with St. Maximilian Kolbe says, that the golden thread running through the Franciscan order, the Immaculate Conception from St. Francis till, well, to ultimately till the end of time, but he says, from St. Francis to 1854, the Franciscans were to proclaim and work for the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Blessed Pius IX was a third order Franciscan. He was given the grace to be the Pope who would proclaim that dogma. And just think, Blessed John Duns Scotus died in 1308. It wasn't proclaimed a dogma until 1854. 
What did I say about God being patient? <laughs> he knows what he's dealing with. He's dealing with us, so he has to be very patient. But it took all that time. And here we are, 2022, and blessed John Duns Scotus is still not saint. He's only blessed. I think part of that is that the devil really hates the fact that he uh, was the, the instrument that God used and seems to be putting a lot of opposition to him becoming saint and a doctor, as he was called the Marian doctor or the subtle doctor, because he was able to explain things that other great theologians couldn't explain. St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure knew Our Lady had no sin, but they didn't know how to explain how was she redeemed then if she had no sin. And that's where he came up with this beautiful insight given to him by Our Lady that preservative redemption and liberative redemption. You know, Blessed John Duns Scotus was not always the sharpest knife in the, in, the, in, the, in the drawer. He was having a hard time with his studies. He was actually going to fail in his theology. And he prayed and asked Our Lady to help him. And Our Lady appeared to him and said, Yes, my son, I will bless you with an intellect, one of the most keenest or whatever intellect, and you'll be my champion, she said. And sure enough, he became, he went from being at the bottom of the class to the first, the top of the class overnight just because she gave him that grace to show you what Our Lady can do for those she wants to use, to show that God's ways are not our ways, that the little ones can be used to bring about her work. He says, Blessed Pius IX says, and hence the very words with which the sacred scriptures speak of uncreated wisdom and set forth as his eternal origin, the church, both in its ecclesiastic offices and in its liturgy, has been wont to apply likewise to the origin of the Blessed Virgin, inasmuch as God, by one and the same decree, had established the origin of Mary and the incarnation of divine wisdom. So when you talk about wisdom, you know that wisdom is portrayed as feminine in the Old, in the Old Testament. The Book of Wisdom talks about it in a feminine way. But that, of course, can be applied first and foremost to Christ, who is the eternal wisdom, but also to Our Lady, who is the seat of wisdom. So much are they so united and so close together. By one and the same decree, he said. Then Pius XII, who came along in 1950s, he wrote an encyclical, Munificentissimus Deus. He was also a third order Franciscan. And he wrote this. I think it's when he proclaimed the dogma of the Assumption. Hence the revered mother of God, and from hence the revered mother of God from all eternity joined in a hidden way with Jesus Christ in one and the same decree of predestination, immaculate in her conception, a most perfect virgin in her divine motherhood the noble associate of the divine redeemer who has won a complete triumph over sin and its consequences finally obtained as the supreme culmination of her privileges that she should be preserved free from the corruption of the tomb and that like her son having overcome death she might be taken up body and soul to the glory of heaven where as queen she sits in splendor at the right hand of her son the immortal king of the ages notice that in that statement, he states five prerogatives of Our Lady. He says, immaculate in her conception, number one. A most perfect virgin, number two. In her divine motherhood, number three. The noble associate of the divine redeemer who has won a complete triumph over sin and its consequences, number four. And number five, assumed into heaven body and soul, number five. But all of those are dogmas except which one? The noble associate of the divine redeemer. That's what we call co-redemption. So, papally, it sounds like there should be five. Just from listening to the popes. Then, Pope St. John Paul II. Not a third order Franciscan, but a third order Carmelite. He wrote this in Redemptoris Mater, for which... 
This beautiful place is named after Mother of the Redeemer. In the mystery of Christ, Mary was ever present, even before the creation of the world, as the one whom the Father has chosen to be the mother of his Son in the Incarnation. So it's in the papal ordinary magisterium of the church that this joint predestination, the absolute primacy of Christ, is Catholic. You can't say, oh, it's a pious, it's a pious thought. No, it's, it's revelation. And uh, Dr. Mark Miravalli, if I can find it here quickly, talks about, he says that uh, the absolute primacy of Christ constitutes a Copernican revolution in theology and consequently Mariology because it places Christ, the son of justice and his immaculate mother, clothed with the son at the center of God's plan as opposed to placing Adam and Eve in the earthly paradise at the center and attempting to measure Christ and Mary according to man's need for redemption from sin. I think it's clear enough that a Christocentric theology, Christology, Mariology, Angelology, and spirituality have different accents and rhythms than that which results from a theology where Christology is centered on sin, even if both positions uphold all of the essential dogmas of the faith. The difference is huge. Just as in our solar system, there is a huge difference between saying the sun is at the center of the earth even if everything can be calculated with great difficulty by saying that the earth is at the center when everyone else was crying earth-centered, the idea of a solar system was revolutionary. But I think there's something more even revolution, more revolutionary than, than, than the Copernican revolution because modern cosmologists, you know, they're always trying to prove that somehow the, the Earth is not important. It's just another planet among the other planets. You know, that it's just one. It just happens to be just one among so big, such a big universe. How can the Earth be anything different or, you might say, um, what's the word, exceptional? Well, modern cosmology, when they're looking for the center of the universe, they were looking for what you might say, what would indicate the center of, of the universe? They look for the magnetic pole of the universe. The whole universe has a ma magnetic pole, has a center. Do you know where that magnetic pole passes through? It passes through our earth. Our earth is the magnetic center of the universe. And they call this, to show you kind of warped how cosmologists are, they call it the axis of evil. It, it just shows you, when you, Christ is not a part of the picture, you would call it the axis of evil. If Christ were the, were, the, were the center of your metaphysics, you would call it the axis of essential goodness. Because this is the place where God chose to become man. Nowhere else on the, in all the universe. Talk about a revolution. So when you talk about the absolute primacy of Christ, it's kind of like that kind of revolution in your theology is that Yes, we're not denying that Christ came and died for our sins, but that's not the primary reason for the incarnation. It's important, it's secondary, but the primary reason for the incarnation is the greatest glory of God. And in doing so, God incorporated the, the redemption as bringing about that greatest glory of God. He didn't say after Adam and Eve, oh, I've got to come up with another plan. No, God only has plan A. There's no plan B with God. But no matter what we do, if we make a big mistake somewhere along the line, he doesn't scrap the plan. As Fulton Sheen said, it's like mankind, like the whole created plan of God was like this beautiful symphony that he wrote. And come along Adam and Eve and they hit a wrong note. Does God scrap the music? Does he throw out the original? He takes that bad note of Adam and Eve and continues to write an even better symphony than before. He doesn't scrap the plan. He just takes it and makes it the first note of a whole new, you might say, beautiful symphony that he's already had in mind. So um, 
It's important that we see this because what we're going to talk about today in this first talk, of course, is one of the first stone. The first stone, which is the Immaculate Conception. Because it's not the first of the dogmas defined in the order of chronology, but rather it's the first of the dogmas that Our Lady, when she was asked by Bernadette, what is your name? Who are you, O beautiful woman? Our Lady said, I am the Immaculate Conception. And St. Maximin Colby, when he heard that, when he was a seminarian in Rome, heard Our Lady refer to herself as the I am the Immaculate Conception. No, that was 1858, four years after the dogma was defined by Pius IX. But when the priest asked Bernadette, Bernadette, do you know what the Immaculate Conception is? She said, no, I don't know, Father. What is the Immaculate Conception? What does that mean? Because she was sickly and she missed that class in catechism. So the priest was convinced that it was Our Lady because he's the one who told her to ask her what is her name. Our Lady could have said, I'm the Blessed Virgin Mary, but she didn't do that. She named what was the greatest grace that God gave her. The greatest grace that God gave her was that first grace upon which all the other graces flow from, and that's her Immaculate Conception. And as Pope Pius IX said, we cannot fathom what it means to be the Immaculate Conception. Only God understands what it means to be the Immaculate Conception. So even though St. Maximin Kolbe came to some very deep and beautiful insights, it's like still just scratching the surface. When we get to heaven, we're going to see all those, as Our Lady said in her Magnificat, the Almighty has done great things in me and holy is his name. We just see a few of those great things that God has done in his mother. But for all eternity, we're just going to be blown away. You can only use the word awesome in reference to God and Our Lady and the things of God. A pizza is not awesome. A car is not awesome. A football game is not awesome. Only God and the things of God are awesome. And that's what we're just going to be. Wow, wow, wow. That's going to be your, you know, other than after holy, 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 it's going to be wow, holy, holy, wow, holy, holy, wow. You know? It's. You're not going to have to, you won't be able to say anything other than that. But St. Maximin Kolbe, reflecting on that Our Lady is the Immaculate Conception, he said, well, what is, an, what is a conception? You know, we, we've heard this all before, but I think it's repetition is the mother of learning, and that's how we learn things. So, you know, is there an eraser? Here we go. A conception is the proof of love, he said, between two persons. And he said, is there, uh, can we say that between the father and the son, that there's a the love for the father, for the son, and the son's love for the Father, is a conception, the fruit of their love? He said, yes. The fruit of their love is the Holy Spirit. And he is an eternal person. That means he has no beginning. So he's the uncreated, immaculate conception because he has no sin. Eternal, created, or I mean, excuse me, e eternal, immaculate conception, Holy Spirit. And that's within the Trinity, ad intra. Ad intra means with ends to the inside, you might say. Ad intra. Ad extra in the created order. Can we say that there's, where's the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father? Where's that terminus or the meeting point of their love? In the Immaculate Conception of Our Lady, who is the created Immaculate Conception. And St. Maximin Kolbe, reflecting on something that he heard in his Franciscan sources, Our Lady is the spouse of the Holy Spirit. 
And who said that? Who was the first one ever in history to say spouse of the Holy Spirit? Our Holy Father, St. Francis, was the first one ever to refer to Our Lady as spouse of the Holy Spirit. In a prayer he composed in which he addresses Our Lady and her relationship to each of the three divine persons. He said, you are the predestined daughter of the Eternal Father, the mother of the Eternal Son, and the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Before that, people would say, oh, Our Lady is the temple of the Holy Spirit, or she's the vessel of the Holy Spirit, or she's something, but not in a personal relationship. He's the first one, St. Francis, to call Our Lady spouse of the Holy Spirit. St. Maxim Coy says, so much is she a spouse of the Holy Spirit that she takes, her, takes his name, Mrs. Immaculate Conception. That's her name. And he used that whole thing about so much. He said this spousal union does not do justice in explaining how these two are united. It's the best we can do with human language. As it said, it fails to say everything it needs to say. He said that God's will, voluntas, which is Latin for will, is a big capital V, uppercase. Our Lady's will is a little one, voluntas. But so much because of the Immaculate Conception, those two wills do not act as two wills, but as one will. And he said it's like you have the Ohio River, and you have the Mississippi, and you have the Missouri River, all flowing into the Mississippi. He said you, at some point, when those rivers combine, the Missouri or the Mississippi, or the Ohio into the Mississippi, for all purposes you just have the Mississippi. And he said, for all purposes, Our Lady's will and God's will are so one that they all, it's just one will. So St. Maximilian Colby would say, I'm doing Our Lady's will. And they would say, well, St. Maximilian, what about God? Well, I don't have to be redundant and keep saying Our Lady's will and God's will, because when I'm doing Our Lady's will, I am doing God's will. His his famous quote that he took from St. Francis, Deus meus et omnia, my God and my all, St. Francis said. St. Maximilian took it and put it, my immaculata, my all. Because that's, to him, is the same thing. To serve Our Lady is to serve God. She's not in a, you know, it's not like, like you, <laughs> it's not like you have two gas stations competing with each other on the corner. She's not trying to steal people away from God. But you know, it's kind of like what you got down the street here. You got two gas stations on the same, two opposite each other, but they're both owned by the same company. You didn't know that, did you? So they have two different names, but all the money goes to the same person. <laughs> well, for God, that's a good thing, because Our Lady and Our Lord are working together. But it's very deceptive when you have two different gas stations with two different names, but the money all goes to the same person. It's called trying to hide your monopoly. But for God, that's how it works. To work for Our Lady or to work for God, they're not in competition. They're working for the same goal because of the grace of her immaculate conception. And we said, how did our, how, blessed John Duns Scotus, arrived at that immaculate conception by coming to understand this whole thing, that he just found this insight that none of the other great theologians were able to find, is God is perfect in every way. Everything that God does, he does perfectly. Is Jesus God? Yes. That means that what he does, everything he did is perfect. So if Jesus is our Redeemer, which he is, that means he's the most perfect Redeemer. That means there has to be at least one member of the human race who is perfectly redeemed or he's not a perfect redeemer. He's only 99% or 90% a redeemer. He's not 100% perfect. And that would be unacceptable for God's standards. So that's how he came to understand and reason to the Immaculate Conception. And that Immaculate Conception is the basis and foundation where he was then able to go and posit and understand the absolute primacy of Christ because from all eternity she had to be immaculate. God's plan would not allow his mother to be corrupted. 
because he wanted to be incarnate. He wanted to be, he, he so much wanted to be revealed to us as a loving God. You know, the circularity we talk about of the Trinity, the circularity that every God, what is love? Love wants to be shared, wants to go out of itself. So you might say the Trinity, love goes out, the circularity, love goes out, and then love wants to return, the gift of the beloved. In Latin, that's called the exitus. And this is called the reditus, the return. Both of these, St. Bonaventure says that the mode of the incarnation is Marian. It means how did the incarnation take place? Through Our Lady and with and through Our Lady. And he says it's not just marrying at the beginning, not just at the first nine months or the first 12 years or the first 33 years. It's marrying at every moment until the end of time. So that this exitus, the Trinity coming out to us, God became man. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That it's marrying in his exitus. God became man. And it's returns by the Holy Spirit in a Marian way. That this Marian exitus and Marian reditus, some saints have called it the, the descending mediation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. God became man through the power of the Blessed Vir through the through the cooperation of the Blessed Virgin Mary and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God returns everything back from the Holy Spirit and Mary through Jesus to the Father. And that's Marian. It's called the ascending mediation. It's called Jacob's ladder, you know? God came down, the angels came up, and they go up, up and down. Jacob's ladder, type of Our Lady. You know, we talked about typology and what... St. John Henry Cardinal Newman, I cannot find this quote where it came from, but our novice master told us that St. John Henry Cardinal Newman was in an argument with a Protestant friend. He wrote something in defense of Our Lady after he became a Catholic. And his Protestant friend said, oh, you Catholics think that every page of Scripture speaks about Our Lady. He goes, oh, no, you're quite wrong. We don't think it speaks about her. We think it screams about her. And the brothers over in Father Jose Maria and Father John Lawrence are trying to come up with what they call a Marian Bible. They're trying to go through the whole Old Testament and find every place that there's a reference to Our Lady in some type or manner in the fathers and doctors of the church. And they have compiled, well, they, they, they say, well, we're going to almost have to, it might be bigger than the Bible, Bible that we want to put the comments in. So they're not sure, well, are we going to put a, a Bible, or are we just going to put uh, all these references in the book and make it another book on its own called the Marian Bible Companion or something? Because they have found so many that, yes, Our Lady's all over the place. When you start having that, that ability to see her in everything, you know, she's the mountain of the Lord. So... Wherever it talks about the mountain of the Lord, it's Our Lady. There's the first type that you can think of that appears in the Old Testament is Virgo. My pen didn't work. Virgo Terra. And we just heard that in the reading I did this morning of Virgo Terra. It means virgin earth that the first Adam was formed by virgin earth. Or as some of the modern translators want to make, you know, the slime of the earth. But that doesn't sound very beautiful. Slime, virgin earth, because God formed Adam from, from, from matter that had no seed-bearing plants in it. It was pure earth. It was virgin earth. And just as the first Adam was formed from the virgin earth, so the second Adam was formed from the Virgin Mary. And this was just repeated today in St. Proclus of Constantinople. He says here, 
He says, um, let the heavens rejoice from above and let the skies rain down justice. For the Lord has had mercy on his people. Let the heavens rejoice from above. For when they were created from the beginning, Adam too was made by his creator from the virgin earth and stood forth as kin and friend of God. Let the heavens rejoice from above, for now by the presence of our Lord in the flesh, the earth has been made holy, and the human race has been freed from its idolatrous sacrifices. Let the skies rain down justice, for on this day Eve's mistake was corrected. See this whole thing about the new Eve. Eve's mistake was corrected and forgiven by the purity of the Virgin Mary and by the God-man born of her. On this day, Adam, after his condemnation of old, was released from the terrifying sentence of darkness. And so Christ was born of a virgin and took his flesh from her, as was his will in accord with the economy of salvation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So it is, it is very clear. St. Maximilian Colby goes on to say in, about this relationship, we talk about Marian Exitus and Reditus. St. Maximilian Colby in his writings, it's one of the most, I think his most powerful statements that he ever made. He says this. Find it here real quick. St. Maximilian Colby talks about this union that took place between Our Lady and Our Lord. Find it here real quickly. Or somewhere I'm missing. Here we go. Find it somewhere. He says that once that union took place in the womb of the Virgin Mary, God becoming man, he says, God does not give any grace, spiritual life, except through the mediators of all graces, by her cooperation and with her consent. So that that would surely indicate, you know, the importance of Our Lady's mediation, that she's not something that is, you know, oh, you know, I don't need Our Lady. She's not important. But God has made her important. Not because, as we said, he had to, but because he wanted to. That that's the whole point. Po to it, de quit fecit. God could do it this way. It was fitting that he do it this way, and therefore he did it. And we're going to hear that so much this weekend that if you forget that, you're going to have angels haunting you. <laughs> Anyway, it's there in his writings, and for some reason, I thought it was there, and it's, it's escaping me at the moment, but when I find it, I'll read it to you in its entirety. But that is and so important that we understand this, that the Immaculate Conception is the foundation of all the graces that Our Lady has received. As St. Maximilian Colby said, she's immaculate because she's the mother of God, and she's the mother of God because she's immaculate. But also you could say she's the perpetual virgin because she's immaculate. And she's the co-redemptrix because she's immaculate. Whatever you want to say about whatever privileges she received is because she's the immaculate conception. Because she was, from all eternity, chosen by God to be his mother. And the immaculate conception had to be. Other saints kind of argue the immaculate conception from like Roman law, which... In, in the early church, they would use law as a way of arguing theologically. And they say, just as a king in an in a, in a empire can say, I put everybody in the kingdom under interdict. You're all, under, you're, all under a, you're all in violation of the law, and I'm punishing you all. But because he's the supreme lawgiver of the kingdom, he can exempt whoever he wants from that punishment. And so, just as a king can do that, an earthly king can say, you're exempt, you're exempt, and you're exempt. So, our, our Lord 
because he's the king of the universe, exempted his mother because she was to be his mother, and she has a special right to that, you might say, a mother should do that for his son, or a son should do that for his mother, excuse me, that he should exempt her from that because, why? Because he loves her, and he doesn't want her to be in the hands of the enemy. He, Our Lady is that little beachhead of grace that God put in the human race. And it wasn't meant to be a poem, but that's how it came out. But she's that little beachhead of grace that wasn't touched when Adam fell. And from that little beachhead, that little portion, and I think that's why St. Francis came to understand in that little chapel out there in the plains of Assisi that was known as the Portziuncula, was also known as Our Lady Queen of the Angels, that he was, she was God's little portion. Our Lady, that little virgin, humble little virgin, but a great in grace, but humble, was God's little portion. And St. Francis understood that because he says that the Portziuncula, that's where he received his vocation to be a friar minor, to be a lesser brother. He said he didn't get that vocation at San Damiano, which said, go and rebuild my church. Because he thought he was supposed to go out and physically build and re rebuild churches that had been falling apart. He didn't quite yet understand his vocation. But Father Peter says it's at the Ports Juncla where he understood that rebuild my church was not to rebuild it physically, but to rebuild it spiritually. By what? Becoming Our Lady's little portion. He wanted to be Our Lady's little portion. He was her little poor man who God would use to help rebuild the church. And Father Peter says it's through... How does, how does St. Francis rebuild the church? By becoming consecrated to Our Lady. That's how we rebuild the church. It's through total consecration to the Immaculata. That's how Father Peter synthesized everything from St. Francis to St. Maximilian and put them, showed how they all are like say, this cohesive unity, this golden thread running through the Franciscan order is, is this notion of total consecration promoting the cause of Mary Immaculate. And that, of course, the first phase, St. Maximilian said, was the proclamation of that dogma in 1854. Now the second phase, which we are living in now, is to now, what does it mean that Our Lady is Immaculate? What's in it for me? We always want to know what's in it for me. What's in it for me that she's the Immaculate Conception? That's why we believe that this future fifth Marian dogma is so important because that tells us what she does. She's the mother cordemtrix. She's the mother mediatrix. And she's the mother advocate. First, you know, we hear St. Maxine Colby talks about your consecration. First, you have to become like her. You Metaphysics. First, you have to be like Our Lady before you can do like Our Lady. So we, we say we want to be her property and possession. We want, kind of, we want to be hers. And then we can start to act like her so we can come, become another Mary living, speaking, and working in the world. So the same thing goes here. Immaculate Conception. The church has told us what it means to be the Immaculate Conception. Now, what does it mean that she's the Immaculate Conception? She's Corridamtrix, Mediatrix, and Advocate. You want to look at it that way, even in a superficial way, there has to be five, not four dogmas. Because we haven't given Our Lady all the glory that she wants. What does God act for? What does He will? Just glory? Great glory? No, He wants the greatest glory for his mother. He just doesn't want her to have some glory. He doesn't want the, his Catholic brothers and sisters to just say, oh yeah, I love Our Lady because she's, you know, four out of five. No, he wants five out of five. God's not satisfied with just four. He wants five. Because 
He wants his mother to have the greatest glory. Because in giving her the greatest glory, he receives the greatest glory. It's not rocket science. But it's simple the way God does things. He doesn't, you know, in that simplicity, there's so much profundity, if you want to put it that way. One of the things you have to show with any dogma that has apostolic origins, that it has scripturally based. So you have to find that it, and it's supported by the fathers and doctors, and that's kind of where we find apostolic origin, because they would go to these apostolic churches that were founded by the apostles themselves, like Syria, Antioch, Chi, uh, e, in, you know, Alexandria, Egypt, or whatever. Find out what those fathers and doctors that they write about Our Lady without sin. One of the first re re references to Our Lady is the Immaculate Conception. Of course, they didn't use the word Immaculate Conception. The church came up with that later on, centuries later. But Panhagia, all holy. What does it mean to be all holy? It means that you're, there's nothing in her that is not holy. And so Panhagia. Then they look to see that this is this concept or this teaching is there from apostolic origins. Then it's supported by scripture, the fathers of the church or whatever, and it's part of the ordinary magisterium of the church. What have Pope said about Our Lady and her, her sinlessness? For example, at one of the councils, it was the Council of Basil, the Dominicans wanted the Pope to condemn Venerable Mary of Agreda's writings, because in her writings she talks about the Immaculate Conception. They said, please condemn her writings because it's too scotistic. She talks about the Immaculate Conception. And the Pope said, no, I will not condemn her. And no one may say anything against Our Lady about her being, you know, sinful or whatever. He said, he reaffirmed her sinlessness. But he didn't say she's Immaculate Conception because he didn't have that, that grace yet at that time to do that. But finally, when, because of St. Blessed John Duns Scotus, he's the one that came up with the term Immaculate Conception. And that's in, he died in 1308. So the church had, to, and there was Franciscans were the ones championing it. There were some Jesuits that came along who would champion the, the idea. But it was the Franciscans who were really behind it. And they were the ones that kept further clarifying and explaining and Continuing, you might say, the cause and def defining and defending it. How St. Francis is truly a Marian saint par excellence. And that St. Maximilian Colby was not a, an aberration or, you know, something that kind of just, you know, came uh, an adopted child. He was really as much a son of St. Francis as anybody. And when Pope Paul VI beatified him, he said he made St. Francis come alive in our day and age. Now, there's not too many saints in the Franciscan order that I know of. Of course, all saints are kind of like models for us to follow, but he was the first one that I know of that a Pope said he made St. Francis come alive in our day and age. So he had, I think, the Pope and the papal authority was kind of saying, you must pay attention to this saint because he has a lot to say about what it means to be a Franciscan. And that's also, I think, a grace that Father Peter started to also, at about that time in 1972, or 70, around there, was to begin to re-examine, what does it mean to be a Franciscan? And they thought, that's what our founders thought was, well, let's look at someone whom the Pope said made St. Francis come alive in our day and age. So this is kind of the fruit of Father Peter's reflection in the second half on that. And um, the first part, of course, is put together by, at that time, Friar Maximilian Dean, who just went through the sources of St. Francis and pointed out how Marian he is. As I said, throughout the ages, probably the friars probably thought at certain points, uh, is this the time that we're going to be able to even have friars who are making a blood oath to defend the Immaculate Conception to the death, you know, shed their blood for the truth of the Immaculate Conception. Some of those friars were the ones that came and evangelized the New World. The friars who had made that kind of vow in Spain was St. 
Junipero Serra was one of those who made a vow to defend the Immaculate Conception. Uh, Juan Zumarraga uh, at Juan, de, you know, at um, at Guadalupe, he was one of those. They said that um, when we were had this Monsignor come from Guadalupe Shrine to talk about Our Lady of Guadalupe during the 10th anniversary in 2018 at um, the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, he said, oh, he said the friars that were there, Juan Zumarga and the friars, the early friars that came to Mexico, they wore a habit just like these friars, a blue-gray habit. That uh, It's interesting that uh, he pointed that out, that there was this, you know, similarity between us at the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe and the cross and the friars that were there in Mexico at the time when the shrine was was established and Our Lady appeared. And who did she appear to? She appeared to, a, talk about how things are kind of circular. She chose to appear to an Indian named Juan, John. John at the foot of the cross. Juan Diego. What was the name of the bishop? Juan Zumarraga who was consecrated to Our Lady, that when he saw the image of Our Lady on his tilma, he didn't, he only saw one thing, and that was the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars. Because in his writing, St. Anthony of Padua talks about Our Lady as standing on the horned moon, because the full moon is perfect like Our Lady, without any defect, but the horned moon is lacking, is deficient, and that's the evil one. Uh, so that he saw Our Lady standing on the horned moon, meaning standing on the serpent, crushing his head. That darkened moon was what the Aztecs worshipped, because whenever the dark moon disappeared, that's when they really thought they had to sacrifice people to make the moon come back. But Our Lady's saying, you don't have to, this is, don't worship this anymore, this is not good. So Our Lady was the perfect way, she, she, she spoke the gospel to do two different cultures and they both got the same message. Only Our Lady and Our Lord could do something as perfectly as that. So, but, so we see the Immaculate Conception has such a great, already you might say, an influence in the New World uh, with, with Our Lady of Guadalupe you mean that's an image of Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. Those friars who came to the New World were, many of them had made a vow to defend the Immaculate Conception to the death. Then, of course, Venerable Mary of Agreda came and bilocated almost 700 times to the New World. At present day El Paso, Texas, in New Mexico, she came 700 times and taught the Indians the faith. First time she appeared, they fired arrows at her and she disappeared. But she came back and eventually they listened to her, what she had to say, and she taught them the faith. Now, she was a poor Claire, conceptionist nun. Not just any poor Claire, but a poor Claire who had a devotion to the Immaculate Conception. So she came to the New World and evangelized them. After her last visit, she told the Indians, go and show yourself to the friars and get baptized. And so what did they do? They went in procession. They made a cross out of two pieces of wood, two branches of a, of a tree. They made a big cross and they walked in procession. And the friars just arrived in that part of Texas or New Mexico. Here comes these Indians in procession with a cross. And they said... What are you people doing? We just got here. How do you know the faith and we just got here? And they said, well, a woman in blue taught us about the faith and she said, come here and be baptized. Well, they didn't know who the woman in blue is and, our, and Venerable Mary of Agra didn't necessarily tell them who she was, but they just knew her as the woman in blue because a poor Claire conceptionist nun wears a white habit with a blue mantle. The last time she appeared to the Indians in El Paso, Texas, when she left, there was this blue flower left in the meadow, covered the meadow in blue flowers to remind them of her blue mantle. The Indians say that that blue flower was left, it's a miraculous flower, left behind by God in memory of Venerable Mary of Agreda. 
the type of Our Lady, you might say, because she's poor Clara Conceptus nun. And that blue flower is the Texas blue bonnet flower. That the Texans, whatever they think its origins are, the Indians say it was a sign of, of this miraculous supernatural event of this nun who bilocated 700 times from the New World to teach them the faith. So, Immaculate Conception again. Poor Claire Conception is nun. Back in 1846, I believe it was, at that time, there was a young priest named Joe, I think his name was John Carroll. I think it was John Carroll. He was the first bishop of the United States. And they were educated in France because at that time, there was no English seminary in England. It was under, you know, Catholicism was forced out of England. So he was educated in Douai, France, or someplace like that. And that's where, because St. Blessed John Duns Scotus taught in Paris. That's where he defended the Immaculate Conception. So that we have this whole Paris school of Mariology, Marian saints, St. Louis de Montfort is from the Paris school, you might say, the French school of Mariology. Isn't it interesting? Could it be that it was this blessed John Don Scotus defending the Immaculate Conception as uh, uh, Hopkins says that he fired, he fired France with love of Mary without spot. So that here we have an American priest educated in France and comes back to the United States and it's through his, through him that he became influential in the early colonists. His brother was, you know, was one of the signers of the, the Declaration of Independence. And because he was a priest and he spoke French in Maryland, you know, you were able to practice your religion there without being, otherwise you would have been hung or killed in any of the other colonies. That's how bad it was in the early colonies. But they asked him, because he spoke French, educated in France, George Washington asked him to please write a letter to the French king asking if he would assist the colonists in their revolt against England. So he was like their ambassador to the French king. He later on became the bishop, first bishop of the United States. And it is said that the United States in its official war college history of the United States, they said it would not have been possible for the colonists to win the Revolutionary War if it wasn't for the involvement of the French. And it was through the influence of an American Catholic, French-speaking American Catholic priest, who later on became bishop, that that was the part to play, you might say, of, of how Catholicism helped bring about, you might say, the United States in one way. Whether you know, ultimately it's not perfect, but he had, they had an involvement. That's what caused George Washington after the Revolutionary War to say, lay, lay off of those Catholics. So they did so much good to help us win the Revolutionary War. And some say that he even had a vision of Our Lady that caused him to become more and more um, favorable to Catholics. But then Carroll, because he was um, influential in that way, he's the one who dedicated the United States to the Immaculate Conception because of his teaching that he probably learned as a priest. Later on, the bishops of the United States in 1846 petitioned Pius IX to make Our Lady the patroness of our country. We are the first country that ever asked for Our Lady's patronage under the title of her Immaculate Conception. And Blessed Pius IX said later on that that was one of the things that caused him to therefore take and look at the Immaculate Conception. Is it a dogma of the faith? Because he was inspired that these American bishops asked for her patronage for their country. And also because he got forced from the Vatican because of the Masonic Revolution taking place in Italy he was almost captured or maybe also killed by the anti-papal forces, the Masonic Revolution in Italy. He was fled to Gaeta in southern Italy when he was in exile from the Vatican. And it's at that time that he said, well, maybe I need to take a look at the Immaculate Conception as a dogma of the faith. 
Notice that in a time of peril and great physical harm to the church and to himself, he didn't look to material. I got to find an army to fight this war. No, he said, I think I need to look at the Immaculate Conception. Is it a dogma of the faith? So when he finally got back to the Vatican, one of the first things he did was call for this meeting of the bishops, this synod of bishops to come to the United, to Rome and to determine, is Our Lady the Immaculate Conception? And in, in the basement of the cathedral in uh, Sydney, Australia, there's a plaque that commemorates the fact that Cardinal Polding went from Australia to the Vatican to talk about or to be there for this meeting to determine Our Lady's Immaculate Conception as a dogma or not. Now, that was a great sacrifice he made to go from Australia all the way to Rome by ship. It took a long time by travel. But when he got there, of course, with Pius IX said, Please, I want you all first, before, we, I, before I act in any way papally, I want to see if there's a consensus among you bishops. Is Our Lady the Immaculate Conception? Is it shown to be traditional, you know, from tradition, sacred scripture, the apostles? Please, let's discuss this and you come to a consensus and I'll base my decision on whatever you decide, you know, letting them kind of see what is the census of the faith, sense of the faith. Well, it seems that instead of coming to any kind of clarity, they just became more confused and it was literally chaos among the bishops. They could not agree on anything. And it says that Cardinal Polding turned to Pope Pius IX and said, you are our father, you are our teacher, you tell us whether she's immaculate or not. So then Pius IX then took that upon himself that it seems that, that it has to be his decision that determines it, that he's going to have to exercise his papal authority. And that's the whole thing about papal authority. There only needs to be one bishop who believes it. And that one bishop has to be the Pope when it comes to even declaring. It could be the whole church could not believe it, but if he knows it to be a dogma of the faith, he is the one who has the power. He doesn't need a consensus, he doesn't need a vote to be taken, but it says that just because he wanted to be, you might say, even more cautious, he called together a few of the cardinals, or maybe the cardinals at that time, which were around a big table, and he said to them, I want you to vote. A black marble means that Our Lady is not immaculate. A white marble means that she is immaculate. And when they cast their votes, he saw in the dish there were more black marbles than white ones. And it's said that Pope Pius IX took off his white zucchetto and put it over the whole dish, and he said, all I see is white. <laughs> so, and so that's when he then proclaimed the Immaculate Conception a dogma of the faith because he knew it to be so. No one else seemed to have that clarity but him. And that's the only one who really needed to have that clarity was that who was the Vicar of Christ. So interesting thing though, that who pro when he went to proclaim the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, he saw a little bishop there, and since he was from the United States, he thought, well, since they did so much a part to play in my proclamation, I'd like this bishop from the United States to hold the proclamation while I read in the fabulous Deus, proclaiming Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. That little bishop from the United States was St. John, St. John Neumann of Philadelphia, who attended that meeting of bishops to discuss Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. He held the proclamation that proclaimed Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. Interesting note, of all the saints who have been associated with the Immaculate Conception, that they are incorrupt. St. John Neumann's body is incorrupt. You can see his incorrupt body in his shrine at the foot of the altar there. St. Bernadette, incorrupt. Looks like she's just sleeping. Fresh as the day, she, you know, fresh. It looks like just a, a living person asleep. St. Catherine Labore, incorrupt. John Neumann, incorrupt. All these have been associated in some way with the Immaculate Conception. Interesting story about St. John Neumann, that when you go to see him, he's laid out in a glass coffin so you can see him there. He's in his bishop's vestments with his mitre on and his staff in his hand. But you see his face and it looks like he has, he has like a plastic mask on, like, you know, some of these realistic hot Halloween masks. He has this 
mask, plastic, plastic covering over his face. And I said, why do they have that? If he's incorrupt, why do they cover his face like that? So I went to the gift shop and I asked him, why does St. John Neumann have this plastic mask? Look, it's realistic, but it's plastic. Why is it covering his face? And the man said that when St. John Neumann was buried, he was holding the crucifix in his hands. And they didn't move the crucifix or take the crucifix out of his hands before they closed the coffin. They just put the coffin lid down and pushed it down. And the crucifix pressed into his face and it damaged his face. So when they exhumed him and found that he was incorrupt, you have this incorrupt saint, but because of poor morticians, you might say, or pallbearers or whoever, they didn't remove, they damaged his face and they didn't think it would be good to show him with his damaged face. So they originally put like a, a mask, a silver, like even you can see the, the death mask of Pius V in St. Mary Majors is made out of silver, but they made a mold of his face and then made this silver cover that looked like him in his death. And they put that over the, this sarcophagus of Pius V's relics. Well, they did the same thing for John Neumann. They made some kind of a, a artistic representation and put it over his face. Well, with the advent, when they went and remodeled the shrine, they have now with new modern science, they have these forensic doctors or scientists who are able to reconstruct what a person looks like. You give them a skull, they can follow and they can reproduce what the person looked like just based on the skull. So they took his face and this artist was able to figure out, you may say, remove the damage from his model that he made. And he made this plastic cover to put over his face so you see what St. John Neumann looks like without a, a damaged face. And he was a very young man. He was only in his 40s when he died. And so here he is laid out in front of the altar. Now, when they went to remodel the shrine, they asked this electrician to redo all the electrical lighting in the coffin of St. John Neumann. But they said, you have to do this at night because we want to be able to keep it open during the day we don't want you disturbing and we don't want to see people you working around his coffin during the day. So you're going to have to come in at night and we lock the doors and you'll be in there and you can do all your work at night. And so this man, the electrician they hired, was not Catholic. But as he was laying next to St. John Neumann's body, putting in these lights, these new LED lights and everything, he kept having this premonition or this urge in his conscience, you must become Catholic. And he worked there for maybe two weeks. But every night when he worked there, he said, you must become Catholic. He couldn't get this out of his head. You must become Catholic. And so what did he do after he finished his work? <laughs> he became a Catholic. But just shows you what a relic of a saint can do, being next to a relic of a saint, that God can work a miraculous conversion in that way that this man just knew. Next to this body of the saint, he just had this impulse and this kind of conviction that he had to become Catholic. So that is kind of the, the, the Immaculate Conception has had such a great influence in our country. And that's why, you know, when Our Lady appeared to our, as Our Lady of America, that's what Sister Mary Ephraim in the 1950s, when she had that revelation, Our Lady said, because of all that you have done for our, for my, for my, being known as the Immaculate Conception, the greatest grace, the first grace that's so precious to her. She says, I want to bless your country. Because at that time they were building in Washington, D.C., they only had the crypt part of the Basilica of her Immaculate Conception. She says, when you finally complete it, I would like you to take me in procession and put me in a place of honor in this new Basilica of the Immaculate Conception and I will work greater miracles than Lourdes and Fatima combined. I think that's what we need right now, is to see something very miraculous, because right now people are very much discouraged. They think, wow, evil seems to be doing everything and getting away with murder, literally, around our world today. Wouldn't we like to see Our Lady finally do something to show forth what God wants? He wants to give His Mother the greatest glory, and especially Immaculate Conception, which is so dear 
to Our Lady and more importantly to the Holy Trinity. You know, I'd like us all to go down there and do it ourselves, but she said the bishops have to do it. Because the bishops are the shepherds. And God wants to bless the shepherds and bless us through the shepherds. So we need to keep praying that that will become, become possible. And um, keep praying though. Our Lady you know, said pray the rosary. And she talked about how she wanted to make the United States a missionary of purity throughout the world. Wouldn't that be astounding? The United States, the most unlikely candidate for being a missionary of purity around the world. That's, that would be like taking a Saul and making him a St. Paul, you know? So let us pray for that. And um, we're going to end there.